welcome. I just want to thank you for joining us today. I'm Cliff May. I'm FDD's founder and president, and we're really pleased to have you here today. Joining us for this event, co-hosted with the Center for New American Security, uh, to mark the release of Michael Gordon's excellent new book, The Great and Destroyed, The Inside Story of the War Against the Islamic State from Barack Obama to Donald Trump. Uh, because Michael has had exceptional access to top U.S. officials and military commanders, and because of his extraordinary first-hand reporting from the battlefields, he's produced a must-read book on this historic conflict. Uh, we were very proud to have Michael with us in-house at FTD for a period while he was working on the book, <clears throat> and we understand he also spent time at CNAS doing the same. We're all happy to see it on the shelves today. It's available for purchase. Uh, all major booksellers online, I'm sure, and for those of you here in person in the back of the room at the conclusion of today's events. Michael Gordon currently serves as the national security correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. In addition to his latest book, he is the co-author with the late General Bernard Trainer, a wonderful man of three definitive histories of the United States wars in Iraq. Now, full disclosure, I've known Michael for a rather long time. Uh, I won't tell you how long because he looks so young that may not want to admit his age, but uh, this clue, we were in the same bullpen at the New York Times in the previous century. <laughs> he was an astonishingly good reporter, I can tell you stories, um, and by the way, reassuring to note, he's still an astonishingly good reporter today, so some things don't change. To dive into this conflict with us and the lessons learned, we are very glad to have with us Lieutenant General Sean McFarland, U.S. Army retired. General McFarland served as a three-star commander of the coalition against ISIS in Syria and Iraq. During his command from 2015 to 2016, coalition forces recaptured nearly half of the enemy's territory and set the conditions for the enemy's final defeat. We'll talk about that a little more today. We're equally honored to have Michelle Flournoy, who served as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy in the Obama administration from 2009. To 2012. She's the co-founder and chair of the CNAS Board of Directors. She's also co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors. Today's conversation will be moderated by my colleague Bradley Bowen. Brad serves as Senior Director at FDD's Center on Military and Political Power, which focuses on defense policy and strategy. He served for years as a Senate National Security Advisor, and before that as an active duty U.S. Army officer, Black Hawk pilot, and assistant professor at West Point. Before I hand the floor over to Brad, just a couple of quick words uh, about FTD for anybody who may not be familiar with us. For more than 20 years, beginning just uh, following the attacks of 9-11, uh, FTD has operated as a nonpartisan research institute exclusively focused on national security and foreign policy. Our experts are a source of timely research, analysis, and policy options. We take no foreign government money, we never have, we never will. For more information on our work, we encourage you to visit our website, it's just fdd.org, fdd.org. You can follow us on Twitter, at FDD. So thank you again for joining us for this important and timely conversation. Brad, I'm pleased to turn this over to you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Cliff, and thanks to everyone uh, for joining us here in the room, which is exciting. Haven't seen this in a while, and uh, thanks for everyone tuning in online. And I also uh, want to congratulate you, Michael, on your extraordinary book, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And Secretary Flournoy and Joe McFarland, uh, what a distinguished panel, and I'm so glad you could join us today, so thank you. Um, my general plan uh, for, for the next hour or so is for us to have a conversation for about 40 minutes or so, and then I'm sincerely eager to get to questions from the audience because we have such a distinguished audience with us, sincerely. So that's the plan, so with that, let's jump right in. Uh, the book is here, you see it displayed in front of us. Uh, so let me start, Michael, if I may, with the most obvious question. This is your fourth book on wars in Iraq, if I'm not mistaken. Why did you decide to write it? And uh, tell us a bit about all the research that went into it, if you wouldn't mind. Well, uh uh, thanks, Brad, for uh, having me here. And I also, I just looking around the audience, I see that uh, what's really interesting about this event is there are a lot of people who are real, play pivotal roles in this uh, successful, it has to be said, uh, campaign against uh, the Islamic State. You know, the United States track record in military conflicts has been mixed, but I think by all um, uh, reasonable measures, you'd have to count this one as a success. Um, 
Well, as you know, I've covered all these conflicts, and I was in seven of them in various parts of the world on the ground as a correspondent, and there's just so much one can do as a newspaper reporter. And I always, every time I was in the middle of these tumultuous and massive events, you know, a war, you get a very close bird's eye view of, of what's happening. Sometimes you're in the middle of these combat operations, but I always wanted to know what was really going on which was hard to know at the time. What were the choices? What was the strategy? What was the road not followed? What was happening in Washington? And in the three previous books, which I did with General Trainer, you know, our goal then was not to be the first out of the gate to write the first book, but to try to take the time to put something together that uh, would stood the test of time. Maybe it wouldn't be the only book on the conflict, but it would be one of the uh, books that people would have to read, and that's the approach I took here. Certainly wasn't the first out of the gate since it took me six years, but um, but uh, and, and I, I what I try to do is what I've done in the past, which is do a lot of shoe leather reporting in Washington at the highest levels I can get to. Um, in, in this case, it was multiple administrations, but also on the ground experience in the Middle East uh, battles in Mosul and and uh, Sinjar. And and um, in, in searing and fuse it together. And one of the things that's still striking to me today is there is no Pentagon history of this conflict. Um, it just hasn't been done. So uh, this is something that uh, there's a reincorporation history of the air. There's pieces of it on the Army side, but no, no one in the, uh, the U.S. government is bothered to do this. So I think it's important to get the record and establish it as best they could well getting was good. That's great. Now, thank you. And one of the things that struck me about the book is reading is that you really went from policy, grand strategy, to strategy, to operations, and tactics kind of seamlessly. Can you speak for just a moment about uh, the embedding that you did, is, that you discussed in the book a little bit, you know, the combatants that you embedded with at key moments during, during the war? So one of the striking features of this war, like the previous unless operation, you know, Iraqi freedom, the invasion, the occupation of Iraq, is there was extensive embedding in, in those conflicts, which I took great advantage of and stayed with units for long periods of time in, in all parts of Iraq. There was no embedding in this war. The military didn't do it. And uh, the Obama administration didn't do it. And it has to be said that today, the Biden administration doesn't do it in terms of our forces in Poland that were mo uh, mobilized there to deter Russian aggression and reinforce NATO. I know because I asked, and the unit agreed, but the, the higher levels of the uh, Biden administration, it was not a, a group. <coughs> but uh, there were opportunities to get close to the action because this was a war where we worked with a vast array of partners. Well, the partners will take you. They didn't have any particular requirements about security, namely your security. And uh, so I was able to go with the Peshmerga and Mosul and Sinjar. I was able to go with the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service and, and in West Mosul. And I was able to interview General Muslim in Syria. And also, on the positive side, on the military, while there was no formal embedding process, I was able to do what they call a battlefield circulation, where you move around the battlefield with General Townsend and people like Colonel Pat Work, who was a key person in the Battle for West Mosul. So I had that kind of access, but um, uh, the embedding was with the partner forces. Thank you. Uh, uh, we mentioned policy. Secretary Flournoy, you obviously, as Cliff said, served as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy in the Obama administration from 2009 to 2012. And um, you know, the, uh, the, the administration's then decision to withdraw U.S. forces from Iraq in 2011 is an important antecedent, I'd say, to the events that Michael described in his book. Before I ask Michael to walk us through some of those key milestones and decisions from 2014 to 2019, I'm wondering if you might be willing to provide your insights into the thinking and policy debates within the administration surrounding the 2011 Iraq withdrawal. Um, let me start by saying, first of all, congratulations, Michael, and how important I think books like this are, because as Americans, we too often are in a hurry to get conflicts in the rearview mirror and not to actually pause and try to learn lessons from them so that we capture what works, we learn from what doesn't work, and we do better the next time, or even avoiding the next time, if possible. Um, 
Um, and thanks to FDE for co-hosting us with CNS. So um, I was uh, definitely present in the decision making um, around uh, President Obama's ultimate choice to withdraw from Iraq. You know, when, when we came into office, we obviously inherited two wars, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and I think the Obama administration, after its initial review, was really kind of following the same approach that the Bush administration had had, which was a very deliberate phase transition or a drawdown based on conditions as Iraqi forces were able to exert control and had the capacity and capability in a given province. There would be a transition of that province. U.S. forces or coalition forces would be repositioned, and gradually we'd be drawing down. And that's that was started in the Bush administration and continued in the early years of the Obama administration. And we came to a point where there was really a question of, do you uh, draw down completely and withdraw, or do you maintain indefinitely some kind of residual force? Um, at the time, both the civilian side and the uh, military side of the Pentagon was pretty unified in, in arguing for a residual force. At that point, we were taking very few casualties, thankfully. Um, but we did feel like our presence in the advise and assist role was strengthening the Iraqi back backbone, was helping to dampen down tensions between the different ethnic elements of the force uh, in Iraq, um, and not ethnic or religious, but Sunni, Shia, Kurd, Kurdish. Um, and that we still had a pretty important glue a role of you know gluing it all together and keeping it going. Um, very fulsome discussion of the pros, the cons, the risks, um, and you know the people committed their views to paper. We had repeated situation room discussions, debates about every aspect. And at the end of the day, the president made his decision, and he wanted to end one of the wars he inherited, and he felt that um, given the threat at the time and the assessment of the Iraqi forces, that they would be able to uh, hold it together with a security assistance mission only. Um, what I think he didn't anticipate was the extent to which um, Maliki, the Prime Minister at the time, um, would uh, be so insecure with the withdrawal of U.S. forces that he would go make a hard turn back towards sectarianism and persecution of the Sunni population, which then created the space for what, what had been AQI, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, to reemerge as ISIS, um, with now the safe haven in Syria um, as well. So I think things very quickly started moving in a bad direction. You know, to Obama's credit, I would say, although I disagreed with this initial decision, obviously, and I made that very clear at the time, um, uh, he did do the right thing, and he, he recognized the threat and, and, and went back in, but I think at some, some great cost. I mean, I, I still am of the mind that he might have deterred that rejuvenation uh, of ISIS had we maintained it. Thank you for that. Uh, with that context in mind, Michael, I want to come to you before I bring General McFarland into the conversation. Following the withdrawal of the U.S. forces in 2011, can you walk us through, if you wouldn't mind, the, the key milestones and decisions associated with really three things, the rise of ISIS, uh, the decision to send U.S. forces back to Iraq, and then ultimately the battle to defeat uh, the ISIS caliphate? Well, I'll do that. Uh, All in like three minutes or less. <laughs> very concisely because I think General McFarland played a very important role along with some people here in the audience in, in uh, building the structure that was needed to um, defeat ISIS. But um, I agree with um, Michelle that um, the uh, with withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq um, uh, created a situation in which Maliki, by the way, is making a bit of a comeback in Iraq now. Um, uh, sectarian tendencies were unleashed, which created a, a ground in, within that country for um, ISIS to gain a greater foothold. And also the absence of American forces really um, uh, uh, led to the uh, deterioration of the Iraqi security forces without that mentoring and presence. It also deprived Washington of the situational awareness it needed of what was happening. And the reason Mosul came as a great shock to the White House, but less of a shock to the U.S. Special Operations Community, because they saw ISIS coming, um, uh, was not so much 
that uh, not only that ISIS had greater capability that was anticipated, but the Iraqi um, security forces were so hollow. And if we had stayed there, we would have been aware of that and we would have been able to address that. In terms of the key milestones, once the President Obama made the decision to go back in, it wasn't such a simple thing because this was an entirely different kind of war. They, the partners are going to do the fighting. We were going to do the mentoring and provide the air. So they had to figure out a scheme to um, employ advisors. That took about two plus years to get right because it took that long for advisors to be fully deployed on the battlefield accompanying Iraqi forces. They had to create a, a command structure for both Iraq and Syria and some sort of unified um, headquarters, that's what uh, General McFarland uh, did. They had to uh, evolve the air strategy from just going after um, uh, targets on you know, in the front lines to going after uh, deep targets. That took some doing and, uh, and, and pushing by the commanders in the field to make happen. They had to work out a system for deconflicting uh, operations with the Russians after they came into Syria, which basically worked, although with some uh, tensions. And so there are a lot of really uh, big pieces had to be put into place to make this work. And it took a, a few years for all of that uh, to happen. It finally reached its fruition before the end of the Obama administration, but it, it didn't come easy. Thank you. Um, General, coming to you, if I may, uh, as Michael accounts in his book, uh, pages 153 and 54, for anyone, 154, for anyone taking notes, you assumed command at Camp, Camp Arjan on September 22nd, 2015. On that day, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter said, quote, as Michael reports, rather than three generals responsible for different aspects of the campaign, as had been the case, I have empowered Lieutenant General McFarland as the single commander of counter ISIL activities in both Iraq and Syria, unquote. Carter said, quote, his efforts will be critical in the coming months. Uh, that was quite an understatement, I, I would say. I'd love to hear you respond in any way you'd like to what Michael just detailed, um, especially anything that occurred after you assumed command. Sure. Thanks, Brad. Well, first of all, you know, I was honored by the confidence that Secretary Carter had in me, and I, I hope I justified it. Um, but um, the, the main job at hand was to create this command and control structure that encompassed both Iraq and Syria, um, and uh, that required us pulling together some of the special operations tribes, as they call themselves, under one command, although they didn't all completely come under that one command, but the coordination was enhanced significantly um, with uh, some of the uh, JSOC teams. But, we brought that together, uh, building up that headquarters uh, presented its own challenges. As Michael recounts a bit in his book, uh, you know, the, the fire marshal at Camp Arif, John, wouldn't let them move into their building because it didn't have enough sprinkler heads, so we had to put them in tents in the, the summer heat of Kuwait uh, in a motor pool next to uh, my headquarters and, you know, backed up reefer vans to, you know, push enough cold air into those things. You know how many sprinkler heads are in tents, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, we pulled that together. And that was important because the command and control in, in two countries uh, had to be balanced against the fact that we had two different sets of authorities, really, for use of force, one in, in Syria, one in Iraq. Um, we had forces distributed in Turkey and Jordan and Kuwait and Qatar and, uh, and of course, uh, in Iraq. Um, we had 29 troop contributing nations out of the coalition of, I think, almost 60 countries. Um, and uh, we had, you know, carrier strike groups operating, and there was a lot of, of activity going on. And, and then uh, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, we were under, in Iraq, Title 22 authority. Uh, we had a chief of mission, a fully operating embassy. Um, <laughs> and, and balancing all those equities. In Syria, we had really two wars happening, not just one. We were fighting ISIS, that was my war. But we also had the uh, civil war going on uh, against uh, Assad, the Assad regime. So, uh, and then the Russians showed up, as Michael said, about a week after I did. Um, so, um, 
getting that command and control structure together allowed, enabled us to have more of a unity of effort because ISIS was not constrained by the Sykes Pico line. You know, they viewed themselves as one single caliphate. They had the advantage of interior lines, and we were on the periphery around them. And so, getting unity of effort, unity of command, was essential to making progress. And then, once we had that, we were able to uh, round out a campaign plan with very three very clear lines of effort. With uh, one of which was the priority, which was defeating ISIS. The second most important was uh, building partner capacity, both in Iraq and in Syria. Um, and then there was uh, leveraging coalition effects as best we could, because as of those 29 troop contributing nations, they all came with their red cards and caveats and so forth. And uh, if you looked at air and ground operations in Iraq and air and ground operations in Syria and plot that as a Venn diagram, at the intersection of those circles, you would probably only find one flag at first, you know, and one that we would all uh, recognize um, just to the right of Michael. So, um, you know, we tried to bring more of those um, into the center of that Venn diagram or closer to the center. So all of that had to happen and it only could happen with uh, one commander charge. We had to develop the plan. Um, once we kind of figure out what our lines of effort were, um, what's first, what's next, and, uh, and identify the decision points that would lead us to those things, uh, those, uh, those transitions, and, uh, and, then what, and then organize ourselves collectively in terms of operations and intelligence collection to facilitate each of those decisions and move the campaign along. Uh, and, uh, and, and once we had that in hand, then we had to kind of communicate that out to all the stakeholders, uh, both here in the United States and around various capitals. Um, and, uh, and and those, I think, were the, the most important initial uh, things that we had to kind of get up and going. The, Michael uh, describes how we, you know the name that we gave this particular strategy was the by, with, and through. And I'd be interested, uh, from your perspective, as the, as the person that was leading this, uh, what were the advantages and challenges associated with a by, with, and through strategy in, in implicit or now explicit contrast with what we did in Afghanistan or in Iraq pre-2011? Yeah. So, um, it, one of the big problems was, not problems, but challenges, is was that by, with, and through, um, who? You know, it wasn't just one indigenous partner force on the ground. There were many in Iraq and Syria some of which, you know, uh, did not get along with one another, um, and some of which we didn't get along. And, you know, this old saw, a friend of, enemy of my enemy is my friend, was not always operative. Uh, and so we had to find ways to balance out uh, mutually uh, 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 hostile forces uh, against uh, the threat by, uh, either assuring one or incentivizing one or the other or both. Um, and we also had to uh, keep in mind that a lot of these indigenous forces were not principally opposed to ISIS. Especially in Syria, they were mainly opposed to the Assad regime. And we were trying to get them to take their eye off the wolf closest to their sled and say, no, could you fight ISIS for us too? I'm like, well, no, ISIS doesn't like Assad either. Why should we fight those guys? Well, because we're asking you to. So, um, and of course, nobody does anything, out, you know, out of pure altruism. So, you know, we provided uh, incentives for them through training and equip funds, other types of uh, support. And one of the most important was air support. Um, you know, uh, we provided them with the uh, ability to conduct operations of interest to them in return for conducting interest uh, operations of interest to uh, the fight against ISIS. So uh, security force assistance was, um, you know, uh, a bit of a learning process, getting to know whose equities were in play and how they balanced out against one another. Then we had the challenge of the fact that a lot of these forces on the ground, well, first of all, in Syria, we had nobody on the ground initially to engage with them. And in Iraq, we had people on the ground, but the people we were on the ground with were trained and equipped for a counterinsurgency battle. And that was not what we were fighting. 
ISIS was a proto-state. It had uh, a hybrid forces in the field bordering on conventional capabilities, and we had to uh, retrain and re-equip a lot of those forces to enable them to, to fight effectively. Um, and then we also had to uh, go through this process that Michael alluded to of getting ourselves properly aligned for the fight with the right authorities, you know, um, and, you know, the rules of engagement and so forth um, to meet the, the, the situation on the ground. Thank you. Michael, your, your book includes a lot of uh, very interesting exclusives and, and backstories. One of them relates to the Syrian Democratic Forces. I'm wondering if you could tell us how we first came to uh, to work with the Syrian Democratic Forces. There's an interesting story there, and I'd love to hear you tell it. So one of the, um, as General Parlin said, one of the striking features about this conflict is we didn't have one partner. We had these multiple partners. And in Iraq, there was the Iraqi Security Forces, which is also not one partner. It's the counterterrorism services, the Iraqi army, it's the federal police, all reporting to different ministries. The Kurdish Peshmerga made up of different uh, political entities there. But there wasn't a, a U.S., obvious U.S. partner force for Syria. And that's where um, ISIS had its uh, capital in Raqqa. So who was going to do that? And one thing that I was striking to me and I was surprised to learn it, but, uh, in, but I, in the course of this research was just uh, how early um, this alliance began. And what actually happened was in August of um, 2014, really the day after Mosul Dam was taken back, uh, then Colonel um, uh, uh, Chris Donahue, uh, later of Last Man Out fame for Kabul, now the three-star commander of the Airborne Corps, he was then the Delta Force commander in, um, in northern Iraq, which was, whose presence was not acknowledged openly by the U.S. government. And he had a meeting in Sulaymaniyah that was brokered by the Kurdish uh, authorities there. Um, we're not on good terms with the Kurdish authorities in Erbil, but that's a separate story. And, and he met with General Maslum, who was then representing the YPG uh, uh, kind of militia. And he basically uh, came up with a concept that that could be the partner force that could be that would stop uh, volunteers from joining the ISIS caliphate coming down through Turkey, basically. And they would stop them in Iraq, and they would stop them in Syria. And there was a basic understanding between uh, Donahue and Muslim reached then. It wasn't yet approved in, in Washington. Uh, there were other suitors. Uh, for General Maslum earlier in the day, he had a meeting with Qasem Soleimani, who tried to strike his own deal uh, with the Syrian Kurds. But Maslum went with the Americans, and it took some time before this relationship gained traction uh, through the fall of Kabani and actually the absence of other solutions, which the administration uh, attempted for a while. But that became the mainstay of the U.S. effort in Syria, and it was absolutely essential although it did take some time to arm and equip them. Based on your reporting, what is the best estimate you've seen in terms of how many casualties the Syrian Democratic Forces sustained in, in going after the caliphate? So I tried to pin that down, and uh, what was not so easy, I think you wrote in the book in excess of 5,000, but I think they claim substantially more. One thing that was striking about this is I think 20 U.S. There were 20 U.S. KIA in combat, as well as of combat in Operation Inherent Resolve. Um, there were thousands of Iraqi security force uh, soldiers and policemen who died. There were probably 5,000 or more SDF, Syrian Democratic Forces, as they branched themselves, who got killed. There were somewhere probably on the order of 1,600 to 8,000 civilians who died in this conflict. So a high price was paid by the partner forces in executing this victory. And, and, and so as a consequence of that, the U.S. casualties were so low. General McFarland, I mean, uh, I, I guess that from an uh, American perspective, that's one of the um, advantages of by with the two strategies that we have motivated partners with shared interests who are enduring much of the sacrifice. Um, 
Uh, is it fair to say that if we didn't have partners like that, those would have been American casualties or we'd still, we could still be confronting the caliphate? Yeah, it, it, it would have been one of those other two outcomes. Neither is good. Either we would have suffered more casualties or we would have had a, a accepted a, a far less favorable uh, outcome with uh, possibly a, a caliphate still operating in some shape or form and potentially a destabilized Iraq. Uh, and, uh, you know, almost as bad as what we see in Syria? Don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. Um, fortunately, we don't have to, uh, you know, deal with that in the spectrum. I'm just going to jump in on this point. I'm just, I mean, the by, with, and through approach has now become sort of, I would say, standard for how we're thinking about sustained counter terrorism operations around the world. And, in this case, it was quite remarkably successful, particularly given the multiplicity of actors who didn't always you know, see things from the same vantage point. But I think in other places where it's ongoing, it's, it's facing some real challenges. And so one of the things that I'm interested in is understanding, and not to take over your job, but no, <laughs> to ask the question, under what conditions does it work well, and when does it not work? Because I'm looking at Somalia today, Yemen today, we're having some real challenges with that approach. And it, it worked, it has worked in those places in earlier times much better than it is working today. So sort of really getting at, in your experience, what, what makes it work and what makes it not work? What are the key conditions that separate success from less than success? Um, well, I can't speak to why it isn't working in some other places. Cause, yeah. uh, but I, I can tell you that one of the reasons it worked in Iraq and Syria is because we had, uh, we were able to gain the trust uh, at the political and military levels uh, of uh, the Iraqi government, the, the Kurdish governments, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, uh, with the, although the, the YPG, SDF uh, civilian leadership is a little bit murkier. Um, there appeared to be buy-in to what we were doing there as well. Um, and, uh, and then we were able to back it up with sufficient resources. We were able to deliver what we promised. I have to tell you that, you know, I come back to my headquarters, uh, you know, with the, you know, my list of things to do uh, several pages long and, and a uh, throbbing headache uh, because I knew it would be difficult to, to provide all the things that were being asked of us but I had a lot of support up and down the chain of command all the way up to the Secretary of Defense you know and I presumably the National Security Council as well um, when I asked for things you know they, they were provided you know not always like the minute I ask for them, you know, Michael points out a little bit of the, the friction and war that occurs, but, you know, I didn't have to worry about balancing the political uh, against the military equities in the states. My boss did that for me, you know, and, um, and I, I got what I needed when I needed it. Um, maybe not as soon as I asked for it, but I think in the, in the long run, you know, in time. But, but those those were, those, that that's why I think it worked, you know, and, and it wasn't just me, I'm, I'm sorry, but to, you know, I had the great support of a U.S. ambassador there, mm -hmm. Ambassador Stu Jones in Iraq, who provided me all kinds of access to all kinds of players that I would not have had, um, to include Hadi al of the Badr organization, and, you know, people, you know, interlocutors that allowed me indirectly to communicate with Qasem Soleimani, even, you know, two degrees or three degrees of separation, but messages, you know, uh, were being uh, tacitly exchanged that way. That, you know, so we were able to work with all the different parties and balance their equities that way. And again, it was the U.S. Embassy team, you know, support that helped even, you know, reaching across into Syria and Turkey, you know, uh, the offices of Brett Kirk and people like that were critical, absolutely critical. Sorry. So I think um, there are a couple. I had to put some thought into you know why it worked uh, in in this conflict, and it did work in the end. And and I I came up with a few things. Uh, one, 
uh, in this conflict, there was accompanying authorities, and it took until really December 2016 to, to fully flesh that out. But under uh, General McFarland, it, uh, for the first time initially, Washington did not allow the advisors to go onto the battlefield with the Iraqi forces except for soft elements. So they were advising from within the wire. A lot of importuning from the generals to Washington, and eventually they allowed this to happen. I think it happened for the first time in the summer of um, 2016 when uh, advisors accompanied an Iraqi battalion crossing the Tigris. But it took a lot of pressure from Baghdad saying, hey, we got to send the advisors out to the field to go with the forces. You can't do this remotely. So that was essential. Um, I think um, another thing is the partners had to be reasonably credible in their own society um, by the standards that prevailed in their cultures, you know. Um, and I think, um, and that was, I think, largely the case, even if they were unorthodox partners like the one Ambassador Robert sitting here worked with, with the SDF or um, the um, uh, they had that kind of uh, credibility. Second of all, there was an enormous amount of resources applied to this in terms of air and reconnaissance, which shouldn't be minimized. And there was um, uh, an advantage here also uh, that the U.S. had in which, in this conflict, the U.S. did not allow the enemy a sanctuary. ISIS did not have a sanctuary in Syria. In, in Afghanistan, the Taliban and their uh, allies had a sanctuary in Pakistan, and that problem was never solved. And uh, But that was a liability that didn't exist in this particular conflict. So I think that this model has potential applicability to the future, although all cases are different. And I would even argue that a, a, a modified version of it, greatly modified, is kind of what we're doing in Ukraine to a certain extent. Yes, we don't have advisors on the ground. We're not doing the airstrikes. But it was the 10th Special Forces Group that trained the Ukrainian forces, we supply intelligence and munitions and arms. You could you could argue that it's an abridged, you know, modified, scaled back version of by with and through that's being carried out today in Ukraine of necessity because the adversary there is a nuclear armed power. I agree with everything Michael just said. I'd like to apply a couple of small caveats. One is it is possible to do too much. Uh, in security force assistance and we try to find that sweet spot in terms of how much support you're providing because uh, you know we were, everything I did was um, against ISIS I had to keep Russia and Iran in mind you know um, and, and try to balance you know what I was tr doing against ISIS and not create another problem for us you know uh, along the way the other thing is uh, it is possible at least uh, in Iraq, my, one of my concerns was that if we do too much, the Iraqis will fall back in old habits and uh, step aside and let us take the lead, you know. And that was not the model we were trying to, uh, you know, uh, follow there. So, you know, it, there was a bit of a, uh, a, a balance there to be struck and, uh, you know, we kind of eased our way into you know, the, the correct level of advice and assist in the company. And one of the great things about accompanying was that, for one thing, you know, the Iraqi security forces would not go to Mosul unless we promised them that we would accompany them. Because their initial fighting was all around Baghdad, from Beji to Ramadi. Uh, going to Mosul was like a moonshot, you know, in 1961. You know, right after you know a rocket blown up on the pad, you know, and they're like, no, now we want you to go to the moon. Um, they, they, that was a big move for them. It was a hundred kilometers basically, and they would have to reassemble, re retrain their armor units, and they hadn't done anything like that <coughs> since they'd invaded Kuwait. Um, so it took time to get all that put together with them, and getting embedded with them was going to be important for that. Same with the S Iraqis. Counterterrorism service guys up in Camp Spiker, you know, we we had to um, kind of put the band together that we were going to take up there to assure, and and, the, and they wanted to know that well, if there are Americans in bed with us, you're not just going to leave us out there in the middle of the desert, surrounded by howling ISIS forces, 
you know, to be massacred. That won't happen if the Americans are with us. So that was a sine qua non for that operation. It was also sine qua non for the KRG for President Barzani. I will not allow Iraqi security forces north of the Green Line unless there are Americans embedded with them. Why? Because the last time the Iraqi army rolled up towards Erbil, you know, it was uh, not to shake hands and, uh, you know, and work together. It was a very different situation. So I want to make sure that there are no shenanigans. So I, so we provided assurance to both partners by being there. Um, and, uh, and we got away with not being embedded in Ramadi because we were relatively close to Ramadi with our support camps in Takatum and Al-Assad, but it would not be that case up around Mosul. And that's why our initial embeds were at Camp Spiker as we were readying the uh, 9th Armored Division and the 2nd ISOF Brigade for that 100 kilometer uh, assault. Thank you. I'm, I'm eager to bring the audience into the conversation. Oh, great. I see hands. If, uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind waiting for the microphone to come to you and then identify yourself, uh, and then we'll go from there. Uh, let's uh, gentleman right here with, uh, in the middle. Thanks so much. I'm Tom Schenker with the Project for Media and National Security, GW. Michael, congratulations. Thanks to all the panelists. My question is about intelligence and warning in a region of the world where our record is not very good. Michael, in the opening pages, you quote the Obama interview with the New Yorker, where he says ISIS is the JV. Uh, clearly, that could be a wrong statement. Didn't set up the, the conditions. Was there no intelligence on the rise of ISIS reaching the commander in chief? Was it inadequate? Was there great intelligence that he wasn't paying attention to? And how could this have happened with the president saying, not a problem? Thank you. My own view on that is that um, the White House was so uh, dedicated to its uh, strategy of bringing a so-called responsible end to the conflict in Iraq that it ignored numerous warning signs uh, that began in August 2013 when Bushar Zabari, the Iraqi foreign minister, went to the Pentagon and had a meeting with Marty Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and asked for help that uh, continued when uh, Colonel Chris Donahue and Mike Nagata, the SOC Send commander, went to Iraq in February 2014 and reported that the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service couldn't handle this new threat ISIS. <coughs> that continued when the Iraqi ambassador sent a memo uh, to Jake Sullivan, then the uh, advisor to Vice President Biden in May of uh, 2014, <coughs> saying they needed American airstrikes and needed to help. I have that letter, I put it in the book, it's quoted in there. And But I think the mindset at the Pentagon at the time, as Michelle said, was they were really hoping that they wouldn't have to engage there, and, and um, they, they were also contending with, to be fair to them, uh, a lot of other middle crises. Uh, Afghanistan, Egypt was in turmoil, Assad used chemical weapons, so there was a lot of other things happening in the Middle East that I think um, uh, diverted the White House from paying attention to this particular file. Michael, let me follow up with you, if I may, on that. Um, you know, the subtitle is from Barack Obama to Donald Trump. What were the similarities and differences that you saw between the two administrations, how they viewed and prosecuted the war? So I, during the uh, presidential campaign, then candidate Trump uh, made a, a number of statements that uh, when, should he become president, he was going to bomb the heck out of ISIS, except he didn't use the word heck. And the, um, hmm and take the gloves off, so to speak, and uh, change the strategy. But in point of fact, President Trump did not change the strategy, and he did not change the rules of engagement, according to the commanders I've talked to. Um, uh, basically, uh, what, uh, the, what he did was he reduced uh, a level of White House oversight, critics would say micromanagement, that slowed the pace of decisions. For example, at the end of the uh, Obama administration, they had a restriction that there could only be three helicopters in Syria at any one time for 72 hours. It was sort of the kind of constraints the White House put on things. Well, the, under H.R. McMaster, President Trump's national security advisor, that was all washed away. But the ironic result was what President Trump did was he prosecuted the Obama administration's strategy, but initially a little more efficiently than Obama himself, with the important caveat 
that he injected a lot of turbulence into the strategy <laughs> by later taking forces out of Syria and back into Syria, then out of Syria and back into Syria and, and towards the end, which um, created a lot of challenges for um, the military commanders. Thank you. Let's go back to the audience, please. Uh, other questions? A question right here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. Dan Lamoff with Washington Post. I uh, wanted to ask uh, a question about, I guess, uh, sort of spasms in foreign policy. Uh, and, and I think we saw one to some degree with the rapid withdrawal from northern Syria uh, during the Trump administration. We've obviously seen others since then, including last summer in Afghanistan. Um, I guess, Michael, uh, as you look at, in, at your reporting here, um, and we look back at that northern Syria episode and, and, and the following months and the way things kind of settled down, uh, how do you see that in retrospect? How do you think it went, uh, and how do you think it settled down? And are there any broader lessons we can take away from that as we look at look ahead to what Afghanistan might be, what Ukraine might be, and some of these other crises that are on the horizon? Well, um, I think it was a mistake to impulsively order troops out of Syria. They fortunately we still have troops and about a thousand troops in Syria in the eastern Syria security area and in that on top garrison. So the U.S. still has a, a presence there, which is important because it's hard over the horizon is not an ideal strategy for, for going after terrorists. This just happened a couple of days ago in, in Syria. It's important to keep a foothold there. But the, the way that was, the way the troops uh, withdrew from some part of northern Syria was certainly uh, put a strain on U.S. relations with the SDF and I think with the U.S. in a somewhat less, uh, in a more disadvantaged position. I mean, he's modest, but sitting here in this front row is an ambassador, Bill Robeck. You should probably say something about it because he was at the Lafarge cement plant for one of the, uh, for that withdrawal when, when it was, uh, well, the ammunition was blown up by the SDF and then later after you left, the U.S. came in and blew up our own headquarters so it wouldn't fall into the Turks' hands. But you had to live through that whole experience. What, what would you say were, were the consequences of that? Oh, I would use the microphone. Thank you. Uh, just a quick observation that um, that decision did inject a tremendous amount of turbulence into the relationship uh, with the SDF. Um, There's the only time I saw the Muslim um, sort of um, lose it, really become quite angry with the, the U.S. Um, with a strong feeling um, for a short period that we had trading. And uh, there was some fear, I think, that if we were really going to leave completely, that the SDF would, um, would splinter and um, be, uh, possibly collapse. In the end, the decision was, was changed to walk back. And, uh, as you mentioned, Michael, you do a very good job describing the book. Um, we did manage to maintain that foothold presence in half of the northeast where we had been and uh, we maintained the true presence. So we salvaged the policy, but it, it was quite turbulent there for, uh, for several weeks. Would you say there was some risk that they might have gone over to the Russians? Too? Uh, yeah, they, 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 they in fact did go over to the Russians in some ways. They let the Russians in in certain areas, uh, Kobani and in some other places, and also let the Syrian regime in there um, in order to preserve those areas from the Turks. They, they, they always were dangling that card, uh, you know, one, in my discussion with the uh, Syrian Kurds. But I do have to say that two of the most uh, important indigenous people, well, I'll say three very important indigenous players on the ground that we were fortunate to have at the time was General Muslim, Prime Minister Abadi, and, uh, and President Barzani, you know, I mean, he, uh, you know, he's a hard negotiator, but, uh, you know, ultimately uh, was a, uh, an important uh, player and, and ally on the ground. Uh, had any one of those three not been there, it's hard to imagine how this would have played out. Okay, other questions from the audience over here? Hi, uh, Wes Morgan, a national security journalist and author of a book about Afghanistan, The Hardest Place. Um, Michael, a through line through all of your books about Iraq uh, is the role of Delta Force, uh, which you've alluded to in your remarks here today. 
but I think uh, a lot of people who read Degrade and Destroy will be really surprised to learn just how extensive that role was, particularly in Syria. You know, far from being just engaged in kind of the boutique counterterrorism rating that I think a lot of people associate Delta Force with, it comes to the point where it is is running all the advise and assist efforts uh, in Syria for the most part. It is running an air campaign within an air campaign. Um, I wonder if you could sort of describe how this unprecedented situation came about, uh, and then also comment a little on, you know, and I'd be curious to hear from General McFarland too about this. I mean, what were the pluses and minuses of this in terms of, you know, freedom of action that it gave the U.S. government uh, versus command and control issues uh, versus <coughs> sort of the obvious transparency issue of having a huge portion of this campaign run by an organization that the U.S. government won't talk about, or even after the fact, getting them to talk about it, as you have done, is like pulling teeth. Yeah, so I'll give a quick answer so General McFarland can, can weigh in. I mean, Delta Force, under, initially under Chris Donahue, which forged a relationship with Muslim, played an absolutely essential role, um, even though its activities at the time were in the shadows. And they, they had the, um, the essential role in Syria, which was basically a soft special forces uh, theater. And uh, they were called uh, Task Force 9, was the nomenclature. And then they, because they were few in numbers, they had to put the 5th Special Forces group underneath them to do a lot of the training and build up the, um, the cadre that had to fight, and that became 9.5. Um, and they, carry, they carried out um, basically that war, and, and I think it, it posed, um, um, and through the climactic battle of Baguz, which was really the end of the um, uh, physical caliphate, I interviewed people involved in that at uh, Camp Lejeune, where they were temporarily, and they walked me through a lot of that. Um, I think it posed at times probably some command and control challenges because I don't think that, I think you you didn't directly control them they had initially their own chain of command they called them their airstrikes um, I think um, for many of these operations are probably kind of, kind of red card authority right you could you could veto something they were going to do but you didn't really directly uh, control it so it was just sort of a unique uh, feature of the war that we had this kind of bifurcated war where we had this army moving on Mosul, basically a kind of conventional army run by the conventional U.S. Army. And then we had a soft war in, in uh, Syria against ISIS, uh, run very much by those guys, lashed together, but but not under, you know, direct command and control. How, how would, what would be your thoughts yeah, on it, that? Yeah, it was, it was definitely a, a hybrid uh, command and control arrangement. Um, we, uh, we stood up the Special Ops Joint Task Force for Operation Harem Resolve, and Secretary Carter's initial thought was all those JSOC guys would be underneath that. Um, and, uh, you, know, uh, well, you know, without going into the sausage making, that wasn't the ultimate outcome of the, the discussion. Um, but uh, there was broad agreement because the JSOC commanders were friends and battle buddies of mine from Afghanistan and you know we were going to get along we were going to work well together Tony Thomas and I and Scotty Miller and you know I mean we'd serve together and, and so um, so we were committed to making sure that all this worked so we had uh, Major General Jim Kraft commanding the special ops and he, he was the supported commander in Syria and the 82nd followed by the 101st was the supported commander in Iraq and each one supported the other in the op in the other country. Now, Jim, you know, yeah, he had these, uh, you know, operators running around, you know, and with fifth group supporting them and all that stuff. But but it was Jim's job to kind of sort all that out. I was the target engagement authority for both Iraq and Syria. Guns was my uh, the guy who actually made that all work for me. But. Um, so, you know, the strikes were all happening based on what level of delegation I gave to those, those guys. And they had their own, what we call CJOC, the Mind Joint Operations Center, that enabled them to make their own uh, strike decisions at that delegated level of authority, just as the JFLIC did, you know. So, um, so it all worked out, and you know, I'm, I'm from New York, so I believe you know, Yogi Berra was right when he said, if it ain't broken, don't break it, you know? And, and you know, the ODA, the, the JSOC guys were the first ones on the ground. They had a relationship with Muslim. 
you know, and, and the special forces guys are set were savvy enough when they came in, the Green Berets being all about the relationships and hey, we're not gonna sever any relationships that you have. We're gonna build on it, we're gonna support it, we're gonna wrap around it. And that's what they did very effectively. So I think our special ops community found ways to, you know, make it all work without confusing those looms. So like, which tribe of special forces are you? Why am I talking to you now instead of you? And they they figured it all out, uh, I think, exceptionally well. And it was really a commitment to teamwork by the special ops folks to each other and with me, the conventional guy, that uh, really smoothed out a lot of the peculiarities of the C2 arrangement. Another question over here in the back, please. Thanks, Brad. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, it's great to see you again. My question is about the efficacy of the buy with and through. My name is Matthew Zayas. I was a co-author of the Army's History of the Iraq War. And uh, I think there's no question that there's, a, there's unanimity about the tactical success of buy with and through. Um, but one of the findings we found in the, our history of the OIF was the greatest benefactor of the war may, may be Taiwan. And so my question then is, if we look at Iraq and Syria today, the PMF is larger than the Iraqi army. Uh, the IRGC controls the line of communication from Tehran through Baghdad, Damascus, and Beirut. Can buy with and through develop, to deliver effects beyond the tactical level at the political or strategic level? And how do we assess that efficacy and whether buy with and through really works at those levels today? So, yeah, I can affect it. Um, when I was in command, uh, well, that's when we occupied Atan, you know, for a couple of reasons. One was to get control of the tri-border area. Uh, another was uh, to provide a springboard for operations up to Abu Kamal in the Euphrates River Valley, uh, just you know, southeast of Dar Zor, which is really kind of the heart of darkness there. And then the third was because it was right astride this line of communication that we saw uh, being created by a, a number of Iranian-backed or Suleimani uh, back actors, you know, through Anbar province uh, up into Syria, which is probably why, you know, the Russians accidentally bombed us there while I was there, um, you, know, I, I, you know, they didn't like us there. Um, and, uh, and so by, by putting ourselves on the ground there, we were able to largely mitigate some of these Iranian efforts at creating, I think, this uh, expanded sphere of influence over Western and bar Eastern Syria. And that's to say we completely eliminated it, but we, we certainly reduced it. Uh, likewise, by being on the ground with uh, Muslim in the north. Uh, in the east, in the Tigris River Valley, it was more of a challenge. And uh, I could see the fingerprints of uh, Soleimani on some of the plans put forth by the Iraqi uh, general officers on how we're going to go up to Mos into Mosul and re and, Fallujah, and around Fallujah, and uh, and by having a strong voice and being the uh, people there, the person in the room who could bring the most resources to bear to help the Iraqis, we were able to keep a lot of the uh, Iranian influence, uh, you know, at an acceptable attempts at, uh, at a, an acceptable level for. You know, for some time around Mosul, it got a lot more complicated. You know, uh, and so, and I can't really talk of that because Steve Townsend had replaced me by then. But um, leading up to that, you know, talking to Hadi, Hadi Alamari, you know, uh, he wanted PMF, you know, and Talafar and places like that. And it was uh, a real challenge trying to keep but keep them at bay. But because we could provide more help to Iraq than. Iran could. Iran could cause more trouble for Iraq. We could provide more help. You know, there was sort of a balance there that we were able to strike with Prime Minister Abadi. Um, and so the buy with and through provides, you know, uh, a way to mitigate those kinds of uh, situations. Not to say it's perfect, but it's better than nothing. Can I jump please, in on please, this question? Yes, I mean, buy with and through is an operational approach, and, and you were mitigating second and third order effects of a much larger strategic decision that was made years earlier, which was to invade Iraq and take out Saddam Hussein's regime. 
which ended, you know, a very long period of Iran and Iraq essentially containing each other, <laughs> being fully preoccupied and containing each other in, in the region. Once you took away Saddam's regime and you had the chaos of Iraq, you, you know, the, the opportunity for Iranian influence to grow was just exponential. And so <coughs> I agree, you know, you set with that reality, you know, you could you can use by with and through to manage some of the second and third order impacts and mitigate some of the challenges. But it's it 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 can't be it's you know, the strategy decision was a bigger decision that was made much prior you know prior that's right. um, that set the conditions that you can only then manage but can't really change with by with and through. Right. That's true. Thank you. One last question from the audience. Yeah, hi. I'm a retired Colonel Eisenhower of the Army U.S. Army Medical Corps. Michael, thank you very much for your book, and uh, this is a question for the three of you. In medicine, we talk about prevention and treatment, but I wanted to ask you a question about, we spent $30 billion arming uh, the Iraqi security forces, and then 500, 1,000 insurgents came out and it, it melted away. Uh, are there, and then the same thing happened in Afghanistan. I'm just curious to see where is the, where is the problem in arming uh, security forces of these countries? We spent so much effort doing that, but but it didn't pan out. I think uh, maybe you can help us, or somebody like me. Can I just say something to somebody who served in both Iraq and Afghanistan uh, before the collapse of their respective militaries? and trying to do what you're talking about. Um, you know, uh, you've, if you've ever taught a kid to ride a bicycle, you know, uh, you, you run alongside with the hand on the back of the bicycle seat uh, for quite a while until that they're ready to, to pedal on their own. Uh, and that can take quite a while. I mean, you look at what the British have done, you know, with their some of these uh, force around the world and Oman and places, you know, it, it, with seconded officers serving in their formation. Sometimes it doesn't take a lot, but it takes just enough, and there's a little bit of science and art mixed together there, and understanding how much of a presence you need to have to provide that reassurance and that level of professionalism to ensure that your money is going into the right place. You know, for every billion dollars that you send, how much is actually reaching the point of need? You have to have enough of an infrastructure there to monitor that. So I don't think that the the problems that we saw in Iraq and, and Afghanistan negate the model. Uh, you know, what I think, if anything, they reinforce the model. Say, you know, you need enough people on the ground because you know I had inspector generals come around saying, "Where's all this stuff that you provided to the Iraqis?" Well, I don't know. I'm not allowed to leave the FOB, you know, so, um, you know, we gave it to them. I assume they're using it. I see them shooting at ISIS on, through my uh, UAV feeds, you know, so, um, but I, can I count for every bullet? No, I, I couldn't in those cases. But in Syria, when we had the troops on the ground, Turkey wanted to know, hey, you know, where's all this ammunition going? Is it going to be used against Turkey? And we were able to provide a reasonable level of assurance that, no, it's going to be used against ISIS because we're there with our hands on the back of the bicycle seat to make sure that it's being used for the intended purpose. So th I think, really, the model is, is fine, you know. It just needs to be followed through. And sometimes it takes a lot of patience across multiple administrations. Secretary Clinton, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I think the, the U.S. hand on the bicycle is, is key. And it, these things take, you know, a very long time. And usually we lose patience or interest or willingness to, to, to bear the cost, whether it's human or financial. And we take our hand off the seat too soon. Um, I think the second challenge is, you know, if you were to do it, another one of my favorite proposed lessons learned is, you know, it's a real historical study of under what conditions does counterinsurgency succeed or fail, a huge factor that we tend not to pay enough attention to is the credibility and legitimacy of the partner that we choose. SDF had incredible local legitimacy, huge benefit. Maliki government, not so much. 
you know, Karzai in Afghanistan, not so much. Fish Huge burning. corruption. You know, Fish yeah. And so the really a clear eyed assessment of does this partner have the the credibility and the legitimacy to be supportable in a way that's successful or not. Um, because I, I think that's a factor that we've tended to, un to discount and believe that we can re somehow remake them or re we change how you know they're viewed among their own population, which is probably something more than we can actually do. Yeah, that, that is a terrific point. I'll just associate myself with that and you know say that that was how we turned the tide in Iraq and OIF was the legitimacy of the tribal forces, uh, you know, outstripped anything that the Iraqi security forces. Uh, and, um, or they provided enough of a veneer of legitimacy to the Iraqi security forces that they were able to uh, turn the tide against the uh, Al Qaeda. Before we conclude, I can't resist the temptation to ask one last quick lightning round question, uh, Madam Secretary, for you and, and for you, General. In a, as some of you may have seen, there was a press release yesterday from U.S. Central Command. Uh, announcing that we had conducted a drone strike against uh, two ISIS officials and that one and maybe both of them were killed. We've talked about the ISIS threat and lessons learned, but unfortunately this threat to some degree is not completely in the rearview mirror. Understanding the difference between a proto-state, as you said, a uh, terrorist organization, and an ideology, those three things aren't the same thing. Is ISIS defeated? One to both of you, and um, based on your answer to that, what force posture do we need going forward in Iraq and Syria to contain that threat? So, um, I, w I once had a, a, a counterpart from the Middle East tell me the problem with you Americans is you think that every problem can be solved. Many problems in our part of the world can only be managed. Um, and so, I think we should continue to pursue the defeat of ISIS, Al Qaeda other groups that pose a threat to the United States and our interest in allies. But I think oh, it, these are very long-term projects. These groups tend to re-institute um, or re regenerate themselves. Um, you know, I don't know why anybody would want to lead ISIS at this point or be the number one or two because you don't tend to have a really long lifespan in that case. But, but they do tend to regenerate. And I think oh, this is something where you have to keep after the problem repeatedly um, until you know it, it you know it, it goes away which may or may not happen so we can contain the threat to us I don't think ISIS is posing a huge threat to the US homeland but you look at even al-qaeda in, in the Arabian Peninsula very busy with the civil war and doing other things but if they turn their attention to the United States they have the historical credibility to actually reach out and touch us so you got to keep your eye on them so we have to have a sustainable, manageable way to keep our eye on these groups and keep putting pressure on them so that they cannot be successful in planning and executing external attacks against us. I'd say absolutely ISIS was defeated because we prevented them from achieving their stated goal of creating a caliphate. Uh, are they eliminated? No. Um, and they've been knocked from a proto-state hybrid conventional force down to a terrorist entity, more amorphous, more difficult. Um, and uh, before the famous FM 3-24 counterinsurgency came, manual came out, um, all we really had was the old low intensity conflict manual. And it said the two principles of low intensity conflict were one, as we mentioned earlier, legitimacy, uh, and two, perseverance. Uh, you know, we've kind of figured out the legitimacy thing. Uh, I hope we've learned the lesson on perseverance as well. All right. Can I just very quickly interject? I agree with fully with both those comments, but it's, it's important to note that Operation Inherent Resolve, which was the name of the ISIS campaign that probably 90% of Americans never heard of uh, under that description, still continues to this day. It's still in effect. <coughs> the caliphate has been defeated, I think, and destroyed, but it's still remnants. But the operation's still there. There's a commander. There's uh, 2,500 U.S. troops in Iraq, and there's a thousand or so in Syria. And it, it seems apparent that uh, one lesson the Biden administration has learned from from history is it's not planning to take these yeah. troops out. It understands it needs to maintain 
his presence to keep the lid on the situation. I just add one thing on the caveat on the perseverance, absolutely. But I think you, we can't let any of this get on automatic pilot where we just kind of treat it like it's unchanging because situations, whether it's the threat, whether it's the partners and what they're willing to do, whether it's other factors, they continue to change. And I think if we don't keep refreshing you know, our assessment of what's going on, what does it take to deal with it, the unnecessary authorities, capabilities, et cetera, we, we can we can get in trouble. So I'm not saying that we're there at this point, but I, I do think that with all that's happening in the world, the rise of China is the case of threat. It's happening in Russia and Ukraine, North Korea, Iran, pursuit of nuclear weapons, all of these other things, we we're, there's a gonna be a um, there is a risk of sort of just putting the counterterrorism work kind of as a background ongoing self generating set of operations, and that that's dangerous to do. we got to keep, keep focused on that as well. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Michael, congratulations again on your book. It's, uh, if anyone hasn't read it yet, I highly recommend it. Uh, you can see my well-tapped version here. Um, and thank you to our exceptional panel. that You bring such uh, insights and expertise. I, I really enjoyed the discussion. I wish we had more time. Uh, thanks to our audience for joining you. Wonderful to have folks here in person, and thanks to everyone online. For more information on FDD and our Center on Military and Political Power, uh, please go to fdd.org. And thanks again to CMAS for co-hosting us. Thank you.